stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. Uh, This evening, Sam and I are going to get together. This is a very special episode. Uh, Brother Sam, what are we going to learn today? Well, a lot of people have a high curiosity for the book of Revelation. And so today what I want to do is look at the two chapters that are written to seven churches in the book of Revelation. A lot of great truth. And I think what you're going to see is a continued reinforcement of all the things that we've been talking about so far. And the application of what God is actually telling us. Also, in Reve- as we go through and we look at this, I'm also going to share what the Bible says of when Jesus comes back. There's a lot of arguments and debates over you know, when Jesus comes back. And I used to argue and debate over these things. Again, until God opened my eyes to see light and truth, it's always been here forever if we just submit ourselves to the Word of God. So we'll reveal that as well. Uh, We'll share what God has already revealed in His Scripture. So with that, why don't we open up in prayer, Kyle? Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this evening. We thank You, O Lord, for this platform. We thank You for the audience that's listening, O Lord. We thank You for You being God on heaven for you sending your spirit down into us believers and empowering us to be righteous and to live righteous and to walk in the ways that you set before us. That is such a blessing and we're so thankful for that pledge that we have as we work in our life in your your works. We pray, O Lord God, that you use this time, that you join us and that that this edifies the church and, uh, and also brings folks to a learning knowledge of the true faith and saving faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So in Romans, or not Romans, Revelation, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, that's where we find the words that were to be recorded down and delivered to the seven churches. And so here, Uh, Jesus is is dictating the words to John. So the first church that we're going to look at is the church at Ephesus. One of the things I want everybody to be aware of as we read through this, he's speaking to churches. He addresses a fact of something that he knows about the churches. Typically from that, he'll then give a command with a consequence. And then at the end, he summarizes a blessing only to those who conquer, who overcome, who have victory. So as we go through this, we're going to look at those different elements, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Other people they go through, they focus on, well, let's focus on uh, Christ and the names that he describes himself and that. I'm going to, okay, yep, we could do that someday, but I want to focus specifically on How does he address the church? What does he say about the church? What does he say if there's a problem? If there is, what is the problem? What is the command that they must do and what's the consequence? And then what's the blessing if you overcome? So with that, first church, Ephesus, chapter 2. Jesus is going to start in verse 2. He's going to say he knows something. What does he say he knows? I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. So he says he knows their deeds. They have toil. They have perseverance. They can't not tolerate evil men. They put to test those who say they're apostles, but they expose them to be false apostles. Sounds like a pretty good list to me, Kyle, doesn't it? So far, yes. Really good. They persevere, 
We talked about Romans chapter 2, about those who persevere in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. They receive eternal life. We talked about uh, those who are able to persevere through trials and temptations in James, uh, those who persevere in Peter, those who have who persevere and have a proven character and hope in Romans. Sounds pretty good. In verse 3, it continues to talk about this perseverance that they have. What does it say? And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Have not grown weary. Wow. They're running the race. With perseverance. This is really good. But then we come to a problem. What does he say the problem is in verse 4? But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. Now, how big of a problem is that? Is that just, uh, hey, you're going to reduce your effectiveness for the kingdom. You still have the promise of salvation. You're, you're still abiding in the hope, but you're going to um, maybe curb the amount of fruit you're producing. I don't know. Let, let's see what he says. What does it mean to leave your first love? What does he say has happened to them in verse 5? Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Wow. He says that this church has fallen. He says that this church must repent. They must go back and do the deeds they did at first. Well, he says that uh, they have perseverance, they can't tolerate evil men, uh, they expose false apostles. They endure. Well, you can do all those things. But if you don't have love, what are you, Kyle? Empty vessel. That's right. You're nothing. You know, the Bible talked about that if you don't have love. Do you remember what, uh, what book talked about uh, the love? Kind of went along with spiritual gifts. It actually started with tongues because people were so obsessed with tongues He's like, you know, you guys need to be taught something about spiritual gifts. Do you remember that what book that was from? It's Corinthians. That's right. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, previously in chapter 12, he's talking about different spiritual gifts. And he was saying, you know, God is, God is the one who appoints the gifts. God distributes all as he chooses. It's God's will. It's his choice. So it goes through the different gifts. And he says, desire earnestly the greater gifts, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And that's the end of chapter 12. And it goes into chapter 13. What does he say? He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, what does he say that he is in verse 1? They've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Just a bunch of noise. What if the person has the gift of prophecy? And they, not just prophecy, but they know all mysteries and all knowledge. Like, wow, this is like super Christian. And this person has all faith. Not just all faith, but Kyle, it says in verse 2, they have faith to remove mountains. Without love, they are nothing. Without love, they are nothing. What if they give all their possessions to feed the poor? And what if they give their own life? What if they lose their life? They give their own life, their body to be burned. If they don't have love, it profits them nothing. Profits them nothing. You see, people, the Bible teaches that love is the fulfillment of the law. If you don't have love, you aren't abiding in Christ. The one who loves keeps the commandments because love doesn't break the commandments. He fulfills all the commandments of God. You can confess. You can serve. You can do this. As Jesus says, people will uh, confess me as Lord. They'll do um, cast out demons. They'll do miracles and healings. They'll exercise certain things of the Spirit. But Jesus will say, depart from me. You continue in iniquity. See, the Bible says that those who love don't sin. Those who love keep the commandments. They obey God. They love their neighbor as them themselves. They don't do any wrong to their neighbor. 
The problem with Ephesus, they were still doing things outwardly, correct? But something in their heart had gone astray. They had left their, left their first love. They're commanded to repent. Again, if they don't com uh, repent, what does he say he's going to do to them in verse 5, Kyle? He will remove their lampstand out of its place. Remove the lampstand out of its place. You know, the Bible t tells us that we're to be a light, a light on a lampstand, not hidden, but where every everyone can see. That we have light that's received from God. That we're to be light of the world. Let our light shine before men. They're to see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. The Father, the spirits before God are referred to as lamps burning brightly before God. The Holy Spirit comes in the world, brings light. You see, Kyle, if a church loses its light, if it loses the oil that burns brightly, the fuel to sustain the light, well, then you fall in, you're falling away from God. You're being extinguished. These people were in a dangerous place. This church was outwardly serving God, but somehow of the heart they had fallen and they, have, they had left their first love. Something else had, had come in. They still had a zeal. They still had a zeal for God. Well, gee, Israel had that. We've looked a lot about how Israel had that. And their deeds. And their toil and their perseverance. But in this case, they had flaws. They didn't have love. So he commands them. This is, that's an imperative command. Imperative command in verse 5. Two of them. Remember and repent. Yep. He goes on. He says, you know, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Okay, good for you. But you have to repent. You have to repent. It's the one who overcomes. The one who conquers in verse 7. That one will be granted what? And Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Do we overcome? Do you overcome? Have you left your first love? Are you in danger of having the lampstand out of your life? Do you have the lampstand in your life. Church of Smyrna starts in verse 8 going down. Jesus says he knows something about this church. Now you'll notice as you go through the churches, sometimes a church will have nothing, nothing bad to say about it. Those are few. Some he'll say, well, you did this okay, you started good, but my goodness, you're, you're ending on the wrong path. Something happened. You have to fix it. I'm giving you an opportunity. You better fix it. Some it's like the whole church. Others it's just some of them, not everybody. It's important to listen to the instruction. There's a command to do something and a consequence. Where do we stand? Smyrna, what does he know about this church in verse 9? I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So he says they have tribulation and they have poverty, but they're rich. You see, in Christ, there's eternal riches. And we know the Bible promises that you're going to have tribulation and persecutions in this world if you follow Christ. So for them, everything looks good for this church. Uh, he says that um, there's people who blaspheme them. Who are the people that blaspheme them? Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Those who say they are Jews, but are who not. You see, when you look at the Bible, the term Jew is supposed to mean somebody who, right, serves God. A lot of times when it's used in the Bible, someone who actually truly serves God, a people of God, a holy people. We know the Bible says that he who is a true Jew is not one who is one outwardly, but a true Jew is one who is one inwardly. 
The Bible says that descendants of Abraham are not those who are physical descendants, but those who are spiritual descendants who are of the promise. See, these people say they're Jews. The problem is if you're truly a Jew, one who serves God, a spiritual Jew, then you would not be of the synagogue of Satan. You would be of the true tabernacle of the Lord God Almighty, and you would be in Christ, his son. The people who are blaspheming them are those who say they serve God, but in a lie. Kyle, do you know how many times I've been accused of blasphemy by other people who call themselves Christians, by other church leaders and pastors who call themselves servants of God, but do not ha accurately handle the word of truth? I'm sure a lot. God speaks about those people. They're false Jews. They don't serve the true God. They serve in the synagogue of Satan and they don't even know it. They're blinded. They're deceived while they deceive others. It's as Jesus said, the blind leading the blind. They're both going to fall into the pit. So these people, they had tribulation, poverty, but they're rich in Christ. They're blasphemed by false Christians who do not serve God, but who serve Satan. But he gives them an instruction. As we've read about throughout the Bible, God tests. He tests to truly know what's in the heart. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. So they're going to be tested. He says, don't fear. You're going to suffer. We read about that. We've been called for this purpose. Just as Christ suffered for us, leaving for us an example for us to follow in his steps. All the sufferings that Peter talks about, that we're to follow in. He suffered for us, leaving an example. The one who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for now for the will of God. Following the example of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4. The other one was from chapter 2. So he's going to be tested. You're going to have tribulation. You have to be faithful until death. And what will he get? The crown of life. You know another place where that comes from? James chapter 1, verse 12. Well, the first part of James talked about perseverance. Count it, all, count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials or temptations. Knowing that the proof of your faith is producing endurance. And endurance must be having its perfect result so that you'll be perfect and complete. Lacking nothing. Then he talks about the man that lacks that will not receive anything from God because he also doubts. Otherwise, it says, ask and you'll be given to you. But there are conditions. You just have to keep reading. But in James chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial or temptation. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to all those who love him. Who are those who love him? Those who keep his commands. Those who persevere. Those who overcome. Not by the strength of the will of man, but by the strength and the power and the will of God. Through the Spirit in them and the man. So to the one who overcomes or the one who conquers, in verse 11, what does he get? He will not be hurt by the second death. On to the next church, the church of Pergamum. What does Jesus say he knows about this church in verse 13? I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So he says they dwell where Satan's throne is. They hold fast his name. They hold fast. They do not deny the faith. They do not deny the faith even when one of the witnesses was, was killed. But there's a problem. What's the problem in verse 14? But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So here, does he say, imply that the whole church is doing this? Some. 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 
So again, you'll find in some churches, like in the first church that we looked at, uh, was it Ephesus? Where it seemed like uh, they lost their speaking love. Speaking to the whole church, you left your first love. Smyrna, Smyrna, there was uh, basically they were doing well. It, it was just you need to continue. It was acknowledging and that they were doing well. You need to continue and pass the test. And pass the test. Pergamum, it looks like they're doing well, except some of them. Some of them in the church were not holding to truth. Now, you know, Nicolaitans, it's not really discussed in the Bible. You'd have to go to other, you know, sources of man to get some more information of that. But, you know, Balaam, we have other things that talk about Balaam. And, um, you know, Balaam, one of the examples it talks about in Peter, in Second Peter, it talks about false prophets, false teachers, uh, who are teaching destructive heresies that deny the master who bought them. Well, real quick, real quick. In 2 Peter, if you don't know, he says in verse 3 that God granted us something. He granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? Well, he says, by the promises of God, in verse 4, that we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Have we escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust? Have we become partakers of the divine nature? He says, for this reason, all commands, we're to apply all diligence in our faith. We're to supply moral excellence, knowledge, mastery, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. He says, if you possess these things, if they're yours, if they continue to abound and increase, and they say, then for you, you're rendered neither useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you lack these qualities in verse 9, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, now I'm on verse 9. Then you're blind, short-sighted, having forgotten your purification from your former or old sins. Then he gives a command. Brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about God's calling and choosing you. Like, well, how do I make certain? That sounds like a good promise. He's commanding us to make certain. Well, the answer is in verse 10. As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Promise of God. As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now, is he talking to somebody who doesn't have the power of God? No. No, he's talking about somebody who became a partaker of the promise, who became a partaker of the divine nature. Now, we know what that means. Go back and read, again, 1 Peter chapter 1 gives more context into that. Look at Romans. Look at the Old Testament scriptures. He says in verse 11, 11, In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. How? Well, one, you have to become a partaker of the divine nature. Then two, you continue to walk and abide in godliness and all the qualities of godliness and love. He says, then we'll be... A lamp shining in a dark place. Oh, well, that's good. But now he's going to talk about the false heresies, the blasphemers of God. This is where Balaam comes in. Listen to this blaspheme. Figure out, see if he can figure it out of what do you think it is. He doesn't tell us exactly what it is, but it's it's so obvious with how the clues he describes it. We already know what, what gets you into eternal life. You have to become a partaker of God through the promise of God. It doesn't say you have to earn it. It's a promise, but you have to receive of it. It's called be, becoming a partaker of the divine nature. Old things passed away. You've escaped the corruptions of the desires of the lust of the flesh. You're now walking and abiding in godliness and love and all the things of God, the qualities of God, the new spirit that you've been born of. And this way is the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. As long as you do these things, you'll never stumble and you'll make certain about your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. This is what Peter says. He says, my time's drawing near. And if there's anything else, this is what I'm going to make certain that you can always re re recall after my departure. Because this is the true gospel of God. But listen to these blasphemers. They teach destructive heresies in chapter 2, verse 1. Denying the master who bought them. Because of these people in verse 2, he says the way of the truth is going to be blasphemed. He says they're going to exploit you with false words. Be careful. 
Their destruction is not asleep. Be careful. And you're left hanging on the edge of your seat saying, hey, but what are those false words? You didn't tell us what the false words are. You didn't tell us what the blaspheme is. Well, he already told us what the truth is of who are those and how to get into the kingdom of heaven. Now he's going to declare to you what is true because these people were blaspheming and were somehow through the weaseling of words and the doctrines of demons and deceitful spirits, they were corrupting the truth. Listen to what God says is true to go against these false teachings. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, what was the problem? Sin. They sinned and continued to sin. God judges the sinner. God destroys the sinner who doesn't repent, who's not changed. Read fully the New Testament scriptures. Go look at the Old Testament scriptures given for our example. Verse 5, still 2 Peter chapter 2. If God did not spare the ancient world, the world of the ungodly, but he preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others. Again, what was the problem? Ungodliness, wickedness, sin. They didn't repent. Verse 6, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing them to ashes, why? Making them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. But he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. For what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day and day by their lawless deeds. But you know, people will say, right, Lot, he was a wicked man. He went to go live in Sodom and Gomorrah. God puts righteous people in darkness and in dark places so they can be light to bring people and rescue them out of darkness. That doesn't mean they're living in darkness. Then in verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. But the Lord knows also how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Have any idea now of what the blaspheming and the heresy was? It said they preached things that denied the master who bought them. Titus tells us about those who deny God. Titus chapter 1 tells us that these people, they confess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient, rejected for any good work. Romans says if you haven't been born again in the Spirit, you cannot produce good fruit. It's impossible. You think you might. You don't have the Spirit. You can't. You see in the pattern. So if that is the backdrop, real quick, fast forwarding up to Balaam, he talks about these people will be destroyed like animals. He says in verse 13 of chapter 2, they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. This is how God sees them. He says their stains, their blemishes, they aren't blameless. They aren't unstained, as we read. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained in the world. We're commanded to live a life blameless until the day of Christ. God commands it. These aren't my commands. This is all the New Testament. He says, these people have eyes full of adultery that are unable to stop or cease from sin. Remember, Romans chapter 7, the adulterous man wants to serve God, but still has sin in their life. This is how God sees them. Are you seeing a pattern here of this false heresy and blaspheming? They have forsaken the right way, and instead they have gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam. See, Balaam was part of this too. It goes on to say in verse 19, people will promise you freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, this he is enslaved. 
If after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, remember you can't escape the defilements of the world, the world, except through the true knowledge of knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then the warning in verse 20, and you're again entangled in these things of the world and are overcome, your last state will be worse than the first state. What? How can my last state be worse than the first? I was already in darkness in the first state. Because you trampled underfoot the blood of the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the sacrifice by which you had been sanctified. Go read Hebrews chapter 10 and see how it explains it. It would be better for them to have not known the way of righteousness, to not have known the way of righteousness, than having known it to then turn away from the holy commandment handed down to them. Some people find truth and then fall away from it. The Bible has many examples of people who fall away from the faith. So back to the example here with this church. So that was back in Second uh, Peter, chapters. Chapter we looked at chapters one and two. Okay. So here, this church. And now we're back to Revelation. Yep, Revelation. There are some chapter people. Chapter two. Yes, chapter two, verse fourteen. There are some people, not all, but some, who are holding to the teaching of Balaam. You see, when you strengthen the hand of people that continue in sin, you don't lead them in repentance. You create a stumbling block. Whether it's idolatry, murder, adultery, any of those things. It's all in the heart. That's how God calls those things in the heart. You cannot promise or tell somebody they have peace with God when they don't have peace with God. So he gives them a command in verse 16. What must they do? Repent. Or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Oh, war. You see, we've, we've moved on from disciplining. It's war. Just as our Heavenly Father said he will unleash the sword to devour against the people that he called and called and called, but they would not repent. They ignored the voice of the Lord. Jesus the Son of God seems to, as he says, I only speak the words of the Father as he's commanded me. It says in the beginning, this is a re revelation of the Father that was handed down to Christ that he gave to the angel to then reveal to John. Do you need to repent? Do you understand if you're in one of these conditions, Christ is going to make war and wage war against you with the sword of his mouth? People, th this is not some minor instru correction, uh, instruction of correction. This is life or death. Spiritual, eternal, life or death instruction. We need to understand the, the significance of the consequences at stake here. People will spend all this time trying to prove what it means to be a, a teacher of the Nicolaitans and miss the whole point of there were people in this church who had a life or death decision. Eternal. Only the one who conquers in verse 17 will get some of the hidden manna, a white stone, a new name written on it. Thyatira, next church. We're under the third one. What does Jesus say he knows about them in verse 19? Actually, this is the fourth one, fourth church. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Well, it sounds like this church is doing well. Is, uh, also, uh, you know, Ephesus sounded like that. Uh, we'll see if the whole church has gone apostate and have, have fallen away and left their first love or if they're still doing good or if only it's some, like in Pergamon. Pergamon was some. So we had Ephesus that it seemed like it was the whole church. Smyrna that was a good church, but you have to continue and overcome the testing and be faithful till the end. Pergamon had some who had were commanded that they had to repent or they had a war that was going to be waged against them. And, and again, same with Ephesus. They were going to get their lamp stand removed. They were going to get their light removed. So now Thyatira sounds like a lot of good things, but we know now we have to keep reading to understand if this was truly in all the right context. So what does verse 20 say? But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. 
Well, that's not good. Uh, obviously, they're they're going against the commands of God, and they're they're committing acts of sin. But again, God's a loving God. He actually gives the woman Jezebel time to repent, but she doesn't want to repent. Verse twenty-one. Correct. So, what does God say He's going to do with not only the woman but also some of these people, the bond servants that are being led astray? What does he say he's going to do in verse 22? Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. Unless they repent of her deeds. Again, sometimes people get so caught up in certain things of idolatry or adultery. Look at how God sees it. Look at how God defined adultery in the Old Testament. Look at how God defined adultery in the New Testament. And he expanded it beyond just adultery of, of the heart, looking at an, a, a woman and lust. But he, command, he expanded it to, when you come before me, like Israel did, and you think you can serve two masters, I'm going to reject you and I'm going to claim and, or proclaim that you are an adulteress. You are living in adultery. False worship, yeah. False worship. Now, it's interesting here because we were just uh, not too long ago in Deuteronomy, and it's talking about this woman who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. One of the very things that you do that we talked about in the last Deuteronomy was that if a prophet tells you that you should go do some other evil iniquity, that that's a, a test that that prophet is a false prophet. Correct. We did. In the last episode, we talked about that in Deuteronomy. Now here, as he continues... People say, okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, so I'm going to get sick. I'm going to have some physical sickness and tribulation, but that, that, that doesn't affect my eternal, does it? What does he say in verse 23? I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. He's going to give according to what? Their deeds. Wow, we, we covered that a lot in the last episode as well. Yes, Searches the heart, the minds, the thoughts. It's all in your heart, your attentions of your heart. These people, are, they're going to be killed. And her children. That's right. That would be, probably be the spiritual offsprings of this falseness. But notice he says in verse 24, he's talking about the rest. The rest who don't do this, who don't hold to this. You see, when people claim to be a prophetess or they're, they're speaking things of God, but they lead you not to repent, but lead you to continue in sin, oh, that's called a, a deep thing of Satan. You see, the deep things of Satan and the doctrines of the Satan is to get you to think that you're actually serving God, but yet you're still a slave and you're serving Satan, the devil. It is a very deep deception. It's so deep. There's many people who know they flat out reject God and say, I don't believe in him. But those who are deeply, deeply deceived, they actually think they're serving God while they're serving the devil. And, and that, like I said, uh, you know, as I said last episode, when we get pastor, uh, the pastor from Kenya on here and let him actually go through and give his testimony where he truly, sincerely thought he was serving God until God opened his eyes. He's like, my God, my God, have mercy on me because he acknowledged and confessed that he'd been serving the devil. And praise God that he repented. Amen. That God opened his eyes and in humility, he was rescued from darkness and out of false light. So there's no other burden on these people who don't do these things. But does that mean that they're okay? What does he say they still must do in 25? Even though they didn't do these other things, they still must do something in verse 25. They must hold fast until I come. Must hold fast. We see a lot of that in Scripture. Hold fast. If you endure to the end. If you continue. Hold fast to my commandments. Hold fast to my ways. It's multifaceted. He just left it up wide, you know, wide open for all of those things. So who is the one he says is the one who conquers in verse 26? Who conquers? He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations. He's going to judge you according to your deeds. You must hold fast until he comes. The one who keeps my deeds until the end. 
That is the one I will give authority over the nations. That is the one in verse 27 that will rule them with a rod of iron. Are you listening to what the Spirit has to say to the churches? See, Jesus spoke of the Spirit of God. He was led by the Spirit of God. All the words he spoke are of God. Yeah, I want to touch on that since because it led me. Uh, as we, we, we very few times as we got to here have read that particular sentence, but I think there's a, an important part there. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's break that down. You, you have to listen to the Spirit of God. You are the church, the believer. When you are Spirit-led, you listen to what the Spirit does. That is a person who has an ear. That's correct. And it's, it's said every one of these churches. Listen to the Spirit. It will lead you to truth. It will, will. Amen. So now we have Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So we've covered four churches, three left. One church, really bad. One church, good, but had to still overcome the test and be, uh, be faithful until death. The next two churches, they had pockets of corruptness in the church. Let's see how the other two churches, or the other three, are faring. Sardis, chapter 3. Uh, what does he say in verse 1? He knows their what? I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. But you are dead. Oh boy. Boy. This is like we're going back to Ephesus again. A church that left the first love. A, a church that's endangered of losing its light. The lampstand being removed from it. The lampstand, the light, that's is indicative of the Holy Spirit of God that gives light. That burns and gives light. This church now, Sardis, they have a name. They think they're obviously alive, but in the eyes of God, they're dead. He knows their deeds. That's right. You know, if, if you hadn't noticed, just to point out, Ephesus, I know your deeds. It's almost like you may think you're doing good, but you don't understand. I know your deeds. And then it's a rebuke. Smyrna, he doesn't say that. You see, Smyrna was a good church. He actually says, I understand your tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. Amen. Pergamum, he says, I know where you dwell, right? And many of them held fast his name. And he says, there's some of you. There's some of you. Thyatira, uh, he's like, I know your deeds. And then he goes and he says, there's some of you. There's some of you. Not good. I'm going to kill them with pestilence. Sardis, I know your deeds. You have a name. But you think you're alive, but you are dead. You're dead. So he gives them a command in verse 2. What does he tell them they must do? Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Their deeds were not completed in the sight of Jesus' as God, his Father. Not completed. They have to wake up. So when he says they're alive, but they're dead, they thought they're alive. He's like, no, no, you're, you're like spiritually dead. But apparently they weren't completely dead, dead, cut off. They were being extinguished, hadn't yet fully been extinguished. And they need to wake up. They have to remember what they had received. They have to remember what they had heard. And they must keep it. And they must repent. What does he say he's going to do to them? What's the consequence? If they don't wake up. If you don't wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. He's going to come as a thief. If they don't wake up, if they don't keep the word of God, if they don't repent, he's going to come as a thief. Go do a word study. He says he comes as a thief, not to sons of light, but he comes only as a thief to those who are sons of darkness. He says he comes as a thief. He assigns people the place of weeping and gnashing and teeth. It's very, very bad for if he's coming as a thief to you. But yet, much of this church was in trouble. Their deeds were not completed. They were about to die. But in this church, it looks like there was few, a remnant maybe. What does he say? Does everybody this way? What does he say in verse 4? 
but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Few people. Few people in this church who had not soiled their garments, who had not gotten themselves dirty and blemished, who remained clean in the sanctification that God had placed them in, who were abiding in the truth, walking in light. They will walk with me in white. They are worthy. You see, people, there's consequences here. Now, God doesn't, just doesn't forget his love for the people. That's why he's a loving God. He's willing to give people a time of repentance. But people who do not repent or people who never found truth in the beginning and don't humble themselves to find true, the true gift of God, well, then they get destroyed. They don't overcome and conquer. They don't get the blessing. Verse 5, only the one who conquers. That word is conquer. That person will be clothed in white gar garments. That person won't have their a name erased from the book of life. Jesus will confess that person's name. Jesus talks to a lot of people where he says, I'm not, I'm not going to confess you. You deny me, I'm going to deny you. You don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. People say, oh no, he can't, he can't erase your name out of the book of life. I said, well, where do you get that? They say right here in verse 5. I said, you, you aren't understanding. He doesn't erase the person's name who hasn't soiled themselves, who walks and abides in the light, or the person who repented and went back and completed their deeds. Yeah, the one that overcome, 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that was 1 John 4, right? Yeah, 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. So in 1 John, just going to that, you said 5, verses 4 and 5. Yes. Now again, the context, people say, but I do believe. So you see, I do overcome. Yeah. Well, go back and see who are those that believe and who are those that are born of God. Who are those that uh, love the Father and love yeah, Christ. those who keep his commandments and his commandments are not so burdensome that's right that's right we've right. been we've been consistent with that the whole time yep but for people who haven't heard maybe this is the first episode oh, okay yes. uh they may not understand the context of what it means to believe he says in 5 2 of first john by this we know that we love the children of god when we love god and keep his commandments this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and those that do are the overcomers correct so I just want to, again, get more of the context. Yeah, no, I understand. If we had time, I'd love to go through the book of First John. We'll do that one day, but for now, we'll go back to Revelation. Another thing in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, people will say, oh, he, he never erases your name out of the, the book, and they'll, they'll use that passage. I'm like, well, that's, that's not what that says if you look at the full context. I'll say, oh, by, by the way, did you ever do a word search of that, of the book of life or the book? Did you know that God actually specifically says that he blots certain names out of the book? I had a conversation with a pastor uh, in the middle of the country in Missouri about this very topic. And he was twisting the word of God. I said, well, let's just sit down. Let, let's go through the word of God and examine it and see what it says. And we actually were meeting for probably over uh, you know, several days, uh, several different times. And um, we finally got to the point of said, well, can we just rely on truth and he kept taking words of God and then would go off and say well this is what it means and he wouldn't substantiate with the word of God so finally I said you continue to, to blaspheme the God, word of God and he was kept making statements one of them was nobody can ever have their name raised out of the book of life and that's not what it says there well I went and I showed him the very he who past. overcomes will be clothed in white and he will not have his name erased from Correct. the book of life I showed him the actual passages and the other parts of the Bible that actually does say that people are erased and I said well how do you reconcile these passages he never got back to me. There are many other topics as well, false claims that he made. I just gave scripture. I said, read this. And he explains what it is. Tell me how you're saying the opposite. He never answered any of the questions because he never had any scripture that he could stand on. And there's many people that don't have scripture that they can stand on without taking it and coming up with their own interpretations instead of going to the word of God and letting it continue to explain itself in context of the book. And, and folks, if you haven't already figured that out this the entire basis for this 
channel for this podcast is to tear down the strongholds of the teachings of men. Uh, we, when, when we go through the scripture, we let the scripture explain itself because that's what it says and, that's, and it has to be kept in context. Otherwise, you get traditions of men, things that mislead, twist, half-truths, quarter-truths. Yep. All of them are non-truths. Two churches left. Church of Philadelphia. So this church, what does he say about them? What do they have in verse 8? Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So for these people, they have a little power. You know, a little power of God is infinite in the comparison of men and the power of men. They kept his word. They have not denied his name. You see, the Bible talks about people who confess God, but he says, but you deny me. You confess with your mouth. You, you, you say you believe me, but the problem is you deny me with your deeds. You deny me with your life. These people haven't denied him. But not only that, what does he say he's going to have people do in verse 9? Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. And that word is the same word that's translated as worship when it's referred to as Christ. It's a, it's a relative term of, of worship uh, based upon one's rank. He's going to make them come and worship, bow down at your feet. Now notice, again, we see this term. We saw it earlier, the church of Smyrna. And we see it again here with Philadelphia. He refers to people who say they're Jews, but they aren't. They're liars. Again, this goes back to the context of who is a spiritual Jew. They say they have fellowship with God, but they don't. You see, spiritually, who does it say they serve? The synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. This is the same thing that we read about earlier with Smyrna. Mm -hmm. These are people... I call them today, just as Romans talked about them in chapter 2, uh, people who claim and boast in the word of God. They believe they're followers of God, but they're hypocrites. They don't have the power of God. These people are, 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 are self-professing Christians that, that are living in darkness. They don't have the truth. They say that they're of God, but they're liars. They actually go worship and fellowship, as God looks at it, synagogue of Satan. You don't worship me in truth. Thank you do, but you deceive yourself. You serve your father, the devil, just as Jesus said, just as the epistles uh, continue to carry that same principle and theme. So in verse 10, what does he say they have done? Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The context of which exact testing, uh, you know, again, for me, I, I don't feel a need to go and try to get into that. He doesn't tell it. If he doesn't tell me clearly, I'm not going to worry about it. But we know that testing, God continues to test. He tests to know what's in the heart. We see that from the very beginning with Abraham all the way through. He continues. But he tells them in verse 11, what must, what, what must they do? I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. So we have a warning. Just because these people were doing good doesn't mean that they're automatically in. Just like Moses warned the people of Israel. Yep. You still have to endure to the end, just as Jesus says, the one who endures the end will be saved. Now, if we have the Spirit of God in us, we can overcome and conquer. If we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, and let the power of God work through us and simply abide in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, we will overcome. But you can't fall back. You can't not finish your race or you're in danger of disqualifying yourself. Paul talked about that with himself several times. Corinthians, Timothy. So hold fast so that no one will take your crown. The one who conquers or overcomes, what does that person receive or get? He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven 
from my God and my new name. Amen. Laodicea, the last church. What does he say to this church in verse 15? I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Hmm. So because they aren't cold, they aren't hot, it says you're lukewarm. What is he going to do to them in verse 16? He's going to spit them out of his mouth. He's going to spit them out of his mouth. You can't serve two masters. You're either hot or you're cold. If you're both, you get rejected. What, who did these people say that they were? Who did they think they were? Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wow. These people are in trouble as well. These people are in trouble. He even gives them advice. Just like Sardis, much of Sardis was in trouble. Much of Ephesus was in trouble. These guys were in trouble. I mean, at least in Sardis, in Ephesus, it said, wake up. Right? Sardis was, you need to wake up. Your deeds aren't complete. You are about to die. You need to remember what you received. You, remember, you need to remember what you had heard. And in Ephesus, you need to go back to your first love. You need to repent. You need to remember from where you have fallen and go back to that previous place. You need to do the deeds at first. This church? They still need to buy from him gold by, refined by fire so that they may become rich. That's right. And white garments so that they may clothe themselves. This, this church reminds me of, really, when I look at Romans chapter 7 in Israel, a people who never came into the fellowship of God for, for those, those periods of those generations that just never had fellowship with God. Yeah, they don't even have the white raiments, so clearly they're, they're not. And in Romans 7, it talks about the adulterous people. They, they serve God on one hand, and yet the other one, they're still a slave of sin. They, they think somehow that they can have the two natures coexisting within them. Can't have two masters. You can't. And so these people, they think they're rich. These people think they're wealthy. These people think that they don't need anything. I have salvation. Is that you? All those that are listening, think about what we read, all these different churches. Any of those dangerous conditions that were discussed, do you have any of that in your life? Well, God's a loving God. He's given us a command. We must repent. He's given us instructions of what we must repent to. And the consequence, if you get right with God and you remain right with God and you conquer until the end, then you receive that, in, that eternal blessing, that inheritance. But if you don't, if you're arrogant, if you're prideful, if you don't humble yourself and you're in that dangerous position, then you're going to follow the path of the many and the wide path that leads to destruction that many have gone before. And you're going to choose death. God has set the path before us. He desires that we choose life. He wants us to become rich. He wants us to be clothed. He wants us to have eyes that can see. Verse 19, it says, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Christ is standing at the door of your heart and he is knocking. Open the door. Let him come in. Be spiritually baptized with Christ. Believe in the power of God. The one who overcomes will be granted to sit down with Christ on his throne as he has sat down with the Father on his. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think with that, we'll close in prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you for your Spirit and the Word of God. We thank you, O God, that the Spirit gives truth. It opens eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, it does an impossible work in a man's life or a woman's life. It brings the gift of righteousness. It does a sanctifying work in a person's life. It gives them a new heart. In spiritual baptism with Christ, it puts to death the old man and the old nature. 
the corruption of the world by lust. It does away with all of that and frees a person from the slavery to that corruption so that they're no longer a slave of sin, but are set free and become a slave of God, a slave of righteousness. Their members are now slaves to serve God Almighty and to walk in the example of their Lord Jesus Christ in holiness and righteousness and truth. Father, let your word and your truth go forth. Let your spirit work and convict. And I pray that people will submit themselves to your truth and the powerful work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus' name. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening. 